Are we live? We are live. Greetings. Welcome. It's been a couple months since we've been a standard oh, yes. live stream. Hit me. I'm ready. I'm excited. Oh, we're going to make sure. I never know what to do the first minute or two. Okay. We have a tip for the month of September. Wilford, first yeah. year RV. Do so that. Have but first, you can welcome people. Hey, welcome Say people. Like, hey, guys. Hey, guys. It's our September live stream. It's our September stream. live stream. And <laughs> <laughs> so we're just going to give everybody a few minutes. To log on and get join, and uh, if you are already with us, just let us know where you are. Where you at? Coming from. And then is live stream one word or two? It's one word. It is one word. Yeah. So this needs to be like squished together. That's Anne's handwriting. My handwriting is not as pretty as that. I feel like like Bob and Doug McKenzie when they when they did their um, and they were like trying to figure out what to say. A hey, take off. A hey. oh, it's fine. What are you gonna change it? Yeah, because it's one word. Can I just copy? Okay, here, let me just move the cursor over and delete that space. It's fine. Don't make me write it because I can't write as pretty as that. Just erase the live. try to do a Facebook live too because it allows that option over there. I don't know if you can do it simultaneously on this as like, but I know you can do it in general. You can do it simultaneously. I don't know if there's another way to do it. Mm. All right. If you have joined us, we don't Greetings. yet know that you have, but give us a second and we will. <laughs> I'm trying to find our live stream. Okay, <laughs> where is everybody? Nobody showed up. Have a whopping two, two viewers. One watching now. That's me. That's you. Yes. Woo! We're we're trending. It's because it's still unlisted. Okay, so we're good. We're trending. Okay. There yeah. we go. You said I September think We are officially public now. A September. Now you're welcome everybody all ah, over again. I'll welcome you all over again. But it's already been okay. It's been recording, but uh, we just went public. We are now public. <laughs> now people can start joining. Yeah. What's our What's our trickler number? You have no viewers right now. M I R V. If we If we went public, what would our stock trickle to be? If we were to go public. What do you mean? If we have stock? Well, we have stock, but we own it all. But like, if we were to go public and become a publicly traded company, and then have our names flowing around. Oh, then it's just M I R V working. Well, it's always like a three or four letter. Oh, it's like an acronym. M I R M I R V. <laughs> you said Republic, so that made my yeah. brain go. Okay, you've got yeah. 15 launches. Yeah. Wow, welcome guys. I got 15. I'm trending now. No. Oh, I need to change the name. You are not on the Patreon August QA. You are on the September live stream <clears throat> QA. The initial getting going thing is always a bit awkward. So <laughs> turn in or, or um, tune in right at the beginning, and you'll just hear us try to fill dead air. <laughs> I never know what to say. And so we do have a couple people joining us, um, or at least that plan to join us today, um, that had reached out with some questions, and I told them, you know, if we join tonight, we could answer We will questions. answer the questions. And let us know where you are. It's always fun. Sometimes we could figure it out, but sometimes it's always fun to hear where folks are. Where you at? Where you at? Yeah. And sometimes we get people that might have been on previous live streams, so it's kind of fun to see you. My eye line is looking at you guys, but every once in a while, if you see me look over there, I'm looking at Anne and Trisha. They're right there. So if you see me look over here, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just looking at them. They're prettier than the camera is. The camera's nice, but it's kind of like this oval looking thing with a light. Yeah. Can you fix that? Yeah, this? Yeah. Also, if you're tuning in and you got an ad, I just took them off. I'm just sorry great. about that. I'm just trying to get all this in We realized that live stream was one word. And not two, and so our grammar bee over here was <laughs> it just was driving her crazy. 
So you don't want me to draw. I, I can draw, but I, I don't have the best penmanship. So. <coughs> All right, so we've got, oh, Kyle. So he's over on Patreon, I Yay. believe. So, um, and Greg is tuning in, and uh, John is tuning in from Minnesota. So welcome, guys. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Uh, Greg might be over on our Patreon. That name looks familiar. That's all I'm basing it off of. Does the name look familiar? I assume you know him. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so uh, maybe I'll kind of like welcome. Oh, be on camera. Uh, I just can't find him. Are you on camera? No. I'm just sitting here, but you're doing all the talking. I know. Welcome everybody. We're so glad you're here. And all I'm gonna turn it to Liz. Make her put her on camera. Tell her. Uh, yeah. I'm be there. on camera. You're yeah, there? Yeah. Okay. I'm on camera. Oh, good, good. I can take my drink of my. Oh, we're on camera. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining. Um, so, we'll be starting in a minute, but um, if you haven't been on here before, a live stream can really be doing monthly. So, for Fridays, I'll be live streaming Fridays and Fridays. So, it's either monthly or at like 4 30 p.m. Eastern Standard <coughs> Time. And the goal is for us to answer your questions live. So it's um, a mighty goal. You put your question in the comments or in the chat, and Darren will do his best to answer them. Unless it's an office question, then it'll go to Ann or Tricia. Yeah. So you can go ahead and start putting your questions in uh, the chat right now. I actually don't have any queued up, but um, we get plenty of comments on the video, so I'll just refer over to you if we don't have questions right away. Oh, you can't hear? Well, no, can't hear us. All right, hold on. Let's make sure you're all plugged in. Hold on, Patricia. Okay, so um, Darren's going to fix the microphone. He's going to fill out a service here. request. It looks like it's working. Just let us know, can anybody hear us? Or, or not us, but can you hear Darren, but not us girls? Or can you not hear it because of your earphones? I'm sure he's expecting an order. I get that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Can't hear us. Can't hear the girls. Okay, okay. so you guys can hear me. Because he's uh, got a voice that carries. Can you hear us now? Can you hear us now? Testing, testing. All right. You know, I don't know if this microphone is working, to be honest. It, it's a new one. Yes, can hear you fine and clear now. Oh, okay. I just oh, like, thank you, Tony. <laughs> Sorry, I okay. just like hit the microphone. Okay. Darren is five five. Five out of five. Yay! <laughs> Way to go, Darren. Come on, us girls are I'm five. I'm an overachiever. Five. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we yeah, are now. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat, and um, uh, if we need to fill it in, I've got uh, questions from our comments from our videos that I can fill it in with. But. Um, yeah, a couple announcements. I'll just put that over to you, Darren. Oh, okay. Cue me up and let me know what I need to say. All right, I got one. You're ready? Oh, wait. Oh, I was back on there. Oh, my oh. gosh. We are, okay. We'll get it together, guys. Okay, do you have our volume low? Because someone said increase our volume. I don't know. Let's just let Darren talk. Okay. Uh, What's my... What, what, service trailer video over on Patreon, any tier level. What she said. Uh, okay, so there's been quite a few folks... Um, okay, I do a mobile RV service, and I believe there's a lot of other folks that want to do mobile RV service, and they've been asking questions like, well, hey, can we see your, your setup? And um, for years, a trailer is a working trailer, and it's not really clean and neat and tidy. It's kind of like a messy room. When you have guests coming over, you want to clean it up. And so um, I believe it was, it was several months ago, I cleaned up my trailer, and I made a video of it. And um, now, that trailer video is been watched several times. We are doing a series over on our Patreon side on how to build, start, maintain, and operate a mobile RV service business. Basically, we've opened up the doors, we're inviting you in to look around. That is something that we're charging for our knowledge, kind of like a coach or a consulting fee. Um, and so for this year, we're gonna probably change it next year, but for this year, if you were a patron, patreon.com, my RV works, um, for starting off at the $15 a month tier, you have access to those that course content. And basically, Trisha and I, we get together, and, and Anne might be on some of them as well, um, um, where we basically go through all kinds of information on 
how to build, start, maintain, and operate a mobile RV service business. All of our best practices from the years that we've been operating, we've relocated and everything. Now, if you want to see what the um, what courses we're covering or what episodes we're covering, you can just go to Patreon for free without paying anything. And you, right, Tricia, they can kind of see the list of videos that we've made. You can't watch the videos for free, but you can see on Patreon. Can they see the video list? You can see the video list. Yes. You just can't click. You can click on them, but it's going to say, "Hey, you got to pay these guys. <laughs> you got to pay us." Um, yeah. So if you want to just see the trailer tour, um, you can subscribe at any level. If you want to um, just check out the course content uh, or the yeah, then you can go. You don't have to subscribe. You can just go to the page. You do have to search um, for that post. So I think it's labeled episode guide. Um, and then if you are interested in watching more than just the trailer tour, then go ahead and subscribe at the 15 or $25 level. And if you have any questions about the benefits or anything like that, you can just give us, uh, an email, um, just send us a message and let us know. And, um, so we'll, uh, if you can confirm, if you can hear me, I'm just holding the mic like right up. Okay. There we go. Okay, Got okay, it. All right. Okay. So we'll start off with the first question. It's just that the trailer video is part of that series on how to build, start, maintain. So we put it in the series, but we, since it's such a popular one, we did open it up for anybody to watch that's in our Patreon. Yeah, we had specifically yep. gotten that request many times from our YouTube yep. people. And so we just wanted to make that more accessible. Yep. So we put it, you can subscribe for $5. And if you want to, you can pay five bucks, get a yeah. tour of the trailer and then cancel. <laughs> But yeah. we don't want you to cancel. We don't want you to cancel. It's like an admission <laughs> fee. It's a pretty cool trailer. It's like an hour long. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's the we, announcement. Yeah. Okay. So question yes. uh, from W. John. What is the easiest way to adjust an electric gear rack slide horizontally? Electric gear rack slide horizontally. Horizontally is upside down. Okay. These are the ones. Uh, uh, tell me if this is correct. It's going to have a bar that comes out and it's got all these teeth on the bottom. Is this about what you've got? And then it's gonna have, how are these things attached? Is, is it this system here? Uh, is this the one he talks about? How to adjust oh, this? Horizontal? Okay, just confirm if that is the is, system. Is this, and it's got this little, there's a there's a bunch, there's wheels on this. I could do this in 3D that might make it show. If this is what he's talking about, then I can, this is the one? I don't know, but just go ahead okay, with what okay. you have to say. So, so if this is what you've got, this ram is not adjustable. It's going to go in and out, period. The thing is typically welded onto the frame of your RV right here. So all your adjustments are made. Yes. Okay, perfect. So so here is, I'll, I'll change colors to blue. So the ram going in and out is fixed. You, that's welded. You can't adjust that. It's going to go in and out. So, But you can adjust your room. The back part of the room, I'll do that in blue here. This is going to be the room itself, okay? So the floor of your RV does that, okay? And then the room, sometimes they have a drop floor, but it doesn't, how to adjust it is irrelevant with the drop floor. So then, but down here is where it's attached, okay? So the important thing to understand is when this thing goes in and out, there is your connection point. The rest of this room slides over the floor and it's kind of coming in and out. So this end of the room is just sliding on the floor. That's why a lot of you will have carpet. There's my carpet. A lot of you will have carpet because this thing's sliding on the carpet. If you take the carpet out and you put in like a wood flooring, they have these things called slickers that you would put to have it slide through. Now, now that we understand what we're talking about, all adjustments are made here. Now, I'm trying to visualize in my brain what this looks like, but you're gonna see a couple different ways um, here on the end. And um, I'm trying to remember what these look like on the end. But um, you're, there's going to be a plate here. Actually, it's two plates. Um, so there's two plates here. Uh, here, it's more like this. I, I'm, if I'm doing it from memory, there's a plate that's attached to the back of this ram that's going in and out. And then you have another plate. I'm exaggerating my bolts here where the room is attached. And then right here is a bolt connecting thing. And they might have, typically you'll also have a jam nut that comes up through here, you know, to, to, to hold the weight. There's a hex. It's it's somewhere in here. I'm just trying to visualize what they look like. But anyway, loosen everything and then adjust the jam nut and then tighten the bolt. There may be several of them, but that's going to raise this portion 
up or down, okay? Um, there's also a way to adjust it in and out right here as well, okay? Um, the tricky thing with adjusting these is it's kind of like a geometry puzzle. If I were to look at this from above, here is our room, okay? And then the RAM is typically like inboard a little bit, okay? So if I need this one to go out a little bit, now you said horizontal and I'm doing the other, then if this one were to go out, then guess what? This one's gonna come in. But he said the room, he said, yes, I meant the room. So. Yeah, the room itself. So yeah. so it's, it's gonna drive you crazy because you just want this one to go out a little bit, but when it goes out, I'm looking down from above, that one's gonna come in. So it, it drives you mad. Raising and lowering it, the challenge you get with raising and lowering the entire room here is you might get it to go out. So a lot of times like this is the side of your RV, and I'm exaggerating, let's say it's, it's way down like this, you gotta make up this gap right here. So you would then push this bolt up, loosen everything, push a jam nut up, that will then torque the room a little bit like this, closing the gap. Wonderful, you've got your seal back. The trick is now you have to close the room and make sure that it's gonna work and seal when it's closed. Um, so a lot of times what I will do is I will bring the room in all the way and hope that I could still get to these bolts, if not bump it out just a little bit and make sure I start with the room in first. And once I know that the room is square and true and everything's in, square with it in, then I bring it out and to see if there's any adjustments that need to be made. But if you make an adjustment out here when it's extended, you need to make sure that it's gonna translate to it being adjusted when it's in as well. Um, they're all, now, oh, oh, okay. I have worked on some of these rooms where over time it's fatigued and there is nothing you can do to square this thing up. If this was like a three-dimensional view here, there's our room. It's almost like if, if this is perfectly plumb, this is off by like two degrees. And there is nothing you can do to fix that. Uh, we did one, it was a relatively new RV, and the whole wall slide, now it was a Schwintech, okay, but this whole wall slide was torqued. And there's nothing we could do to get it to square up. And then we started to take some measurements to it, come to find out that the entire room was kind of torqued a little bit. You can't fix that. So we had to get the room in just enough for her to travel back to the dealership, or not the dealership, but the factory, and they were gonna swap out the entire room because the RV was still new. So anyway, it's all done here at the end. It's a geometry puzzle. Um, if you study underneath here enough, you'll see how to raise and lower your room, how to bring this part in and out, Everything you do to this side is gonna translate over to the other side. So if you raise this an inch, that, it, that one may not go down an inch, but it's gonna adjust it, it's gonna affect it. Um, so I hope that helps, but all of it's done right in this area right here. Everything that you need to do is right here. The RAM, you can't adjust. The RAM is the RAM. The RAM rides on these little steel wheels down here, and then there's the, the motor. Um, these are little steel rollers. If your room is making a terrible squeaky squeak sound, it's the drive shaft that's going through the steel wheels. And what you do is you take a, like a little bottle jack or, or floor jack or something, and you take the weight off of this and you, you get into here, you take the bolt out, grease the bolt really well, put it back in. But you gotta take the weight off of the ram in order to do that. Another place these things squeak really, really bad is on the end port side, way up in here, there's a roller up offset a little bit from the ram, and that's a steel roller. It's riding inside of a C channel or like a, yeah, I guess it's an upside down C channel. The roller is rolling inside of here and sometimes those squeak as well. Um, these are really hard to get to. You, it, this is really, really hard to get to. But these are easy enough to get to, but you do need to take the weight off the room to get it. So some of the best practices on the RAM, uh, all your adjustments are made right there. You just gotta study it. And honestly, I would give yourself, if you do this all the time, I'd give myself an hour, but if, if Give yourself some time. Don't allow yourself to get frustrated. You're going to get it perfect when it's out. Perfect. Okay, take a breath, bring it in. And then you might find out that it's not closing all the way. It's not sealing all the way. Take another breath, fix it on the inside. And then by playing in and out, in and out, you will eventually get it 
where it needs to be. Um, but it's it's not a, um, I can't give you a sign, well, this one's 5.7 turns. It, it, it's not like it's more of an art, okay? And if it's torqued, all bets are off. You're in really tall weeds when they're torqued or crooked. So, okay, that's my answer there. Okay. Good. All right, so I'm going to race my bottle jack and my ram. I hope that helped. Okay. Rick Larson asks a question. Ready? I am ready. I'm listening. I measured my propane pressure at the fridge okay. using a tap jig in the line before the valve. It is only 8.7 with the number 41 hole open. But using the 1 8th jig in the valve port with gas flowing, it was 11.3. Uh, he's like, sorry, I I ask fridge propane question every month. Laugh out loud. Okay, so you have 11.3. Wait, well, let me just make okay. sure. You have 11.3 at the gas port. That's the little, you take off that little hex nut and you screw the thing in there. But what was the 8.7? Uh, 8.7 with the f number 41 hole open. Using a tap jig in the line before the valve. Not connected to the refrigerator? At the refrigerator. He says, pro measured my propane pressure at the fridge. Okay, so Using you're... Using a tap jig. Uh, all right, hold on. I know there's more to the question. I just want... Oh. So here, here's your gas valve. Here's your solenoid. And here's the gas valve. And then it's got the jet on the end. And then here is that little port where you're going to connect that to. And then this then is where your uh, 3 8 copper tubing connects. So for this one, is is he taking this physically off and putting the tap jig directly to here and then letting it flow through a 41? Or is it a pass-through where he's getting a reading through the valve is a question that I have. So for the 8.7, is this physically disconnected and then you have the tap jig on it right here and you're getting 8.7? And then when you've got your gas port here, you're getting 11.3? Or is this connected and you're getting it? So I need clarity on that. Okay, go on with the rest of the question. Okay, and he said, I should have said, I have a Norcold N8X okay. on a 24-foot okay. trailer. Okay. I've blown out the lines, okay. bought a new canister, new regulator, and pigtails. Fridge goes out while driving. Had an RV tech look at it, but no answer. Okay, and so you can, I just, okay. I just want to apologize to all you people that are watching this live stream. And if you tune in in October, I promise it will be better because I just realized I have been lagging on getting the camera back and forth to who it should be. So I think that whole time that Darren was talking and drawing that diagram, it was on us. You missed my drawing? I know. I, so I could draw it again. I'm so sorry. Quick. Okay, I'm going to get it back to Darren and then oh, uh, I'll just focus in on making sure the camera's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so can they see this drawing? And Rick did say yes on 11.3. Okay, 11.3, he's actually physically connected to the gas port. But yes. on the 8.7, is it passing through the line through the gas valve or is it dead ending into the number 41 hole? Okay, so and then he says 8.7 was using 3 uh, eighth jig by disconnecting the line. I can't see okay, this picture. Got it. Okay, okay, okay. So which we corrected. I understand. Sorry. Okay, I, I, I'm. But that was a piece of information you didn't know. Go on with the rest of the question. Okay. Um, so go back to the original question. Okay. I measured my propane pressure at the fridge using a tap jig in the line before the valve. It is only 8.7 with the number 41 hole open. Okay. But using the 1 8th jig the, in the valve yep. port with yep. gas flowing, it was 11.3. 11.3, but we're still going to be going through the number 41 hole. No, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. It's going to go through the manometer. Got it. Okay. So his question is, why is it 8.7? I don't know. Rick, can you clarify? Because I, I see... I, I think I know where you're going with this. Is the refrigerator... No. Now, he also said that when he's traveling, the refrigerator flames out. Okay. I, I think I understand enough to answer this one. Um, so let me erase this part. And uh, Rick... Rick. Rick. Okay, Rick. Yeah, Rick. Okay. Um, what kind of RV is this? It's a smaller. Twenty-four like, foot trailer. He didn't. Okay, twenty-four. But so, it's a so Norcold in eight X. Those are the European style, so it's probably a smaller. Um, okay, so a couple things there. 
I'm gonna address this two ways. One, if I did a video on a truck camper. So if you go to our playlist and you look for the LP, I'm doing a, a propane pressure test on a truck camper and the pressure was getting the same kind of results. And it turns out after I was dealing with this, see in our industry, the number 41 whole orifice equals 75,000 BTUs. See my handwriting isn't as pretty as Anne's. So a number 41 hole equals 75,000 BTUs. Now, where are we getting 75,000 BTUs? That would be a typical 50% load of an RV. That is to say that if your stove was on, if your refrigerator was on LP, if your water heater was on LP, oh, let's see what else, your oven, your furnace, and all those types of things, then they would expect that you're gonna be closer to 150,000 BTUs or whatever that number is. The, the, what you're supposed to do, which no one ever does, is go around to every single gas consuming appliance and physically take a pad and a paper and write down the, the BTU rating for that appliance. What's important to note is the BTU rating for that appliance is what is connected to the in-feed port of the appliance, not how much heat it's gonna generate. So if I have a 30,000 BTU furnace, that doesn't mean it's gonna give me 30,000 BTUs, it just means that it's going to consume 30,000 BTUs at the input port. Got it? So where we get that 41 hole, I believe from memory it's 75,000 BTUs, which is supposed to equal 50% load of an RV, okay? Of a typical RV. And so in our industry, we're using a 41 hole. If you were to use your web search engine of choice and type in something like whole orifice with gas pressure, you're gonna get a, a, a list. I've got one printed out. I'll make a tech card out of it. I've already done one, but it's my sheet. So what you need to do is go around and find out what the BTU is for this refrigerator. Find out what the BTU is for your water heater. If you have a gas water heater, find out what the BTU is and then write that number. I doubt that it's gonna be twice this. I doubt your, your 24 foot trailer is gonna have 150,000 BTU um, consumption. Okay, so going back to that, what, we're, what you're supposed to do is go to every single gas consuming appliance, write down all the input at BTUs of every appliance, divide that in half, and that's your 50% load to satisfy the NFPA 1192.5 requirement for doing an, an, a 50% load test on an RV, okay? So what I'm saying is I'm thinking that the number 41 hole, which equals 75,000 BTUs, might be too large of a hole for your Apply. I don't think that if you were to add everything up, you're going to get 150,000 BTUs. Let's say you're going to get 80,000 BTUs. Okay. So let's just say that if you were to add everything up, you're going to get 80,000 BTUs. Well, half of that is 40,000. So you need to find out what size hole you need to do a 40,000 BTU uh, through your orifice. Okay. When I did that video, I was using a number 41 hole on a small truck camper that had a, didn't even have an oven. It just had a stove top, a six gallon water heater, and a really small refrigerator. That's it. So if I were to add up all the, how much does a stove consume, the six gallon water heater, and the little bitty small refrigerator, it wasn't 50,000, which is half of 75, which equal to 41 whole. It would have been much, much less. Therefore, my whole size need to be smaller in order for that number right there to equal something that makes sense, okay? So the 41 hole is not, that's just our industry standard for a standard RV that has a standard stove, a standard oven, a standard 10 gallon water heater, standard refrigerator. I think you understand where I'm going with it. So when I make these tap jigs now, is it one of our tap jigs that we market? Probably, okay. yeah. Um, I use, I don't know what Loctite it is, but it's lock, it's red It's red thread locker rated for gas systems because I've, I've made them in the past for myself and I'd be wrenching on them and the thing comes apart. And I wanted to make sure that anything that I made, once it's gas tight, it's gas tight. You can wrench on it. So I use red thread locker, but the, 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 mm, the hex head that screws in, I use rector seal number, number five on that, that, that uh, yellow stuff. So you can easily rep swap that out. If you had a small trailer versus a big triple axle, two furnaces, all this kind of stuff, well then that whole size is gonna be different because these numbers are gonna be different. So I allow on the tap jigs that LP port, uh, the, the number 41 hole, you can change that out, drill your own hole and all this kind of stuff. 
Um, so that's, uh, Anne's got her hand up, but that's what's going on with, with the whole size and that's what's going on with your 8.7 as it's coming through and it's going out to open air, okay? The other thing to note is in an RV, when these appliances are being consumed, we're not venting to open air. We're venting through a gas valve. There's a little bit of a restriction in all this. So even though the NFPA 1192.5 says, this is how you do an LP pressure test. Hold on, let's... Hold on, hold on. Here, turn that off, please. Okay. Even though the NFPA 1192.5 talks about using a number 41 hole and doing a 50% load, it's still going, when we do our test, it's going to outside air, and even that is not a, a laboratory scientific method of doing things. So that's what's going on with your 41 hole. You might need to figure out what your load is, and then Google that chart to find out what size hole you need. Get another um, plug, drill that hole in it, and that would give this the exact right number. Now, I do like the 11.3, but see, this is this is, is there's lockout pressure and there's operating pressure, and so we need to find out. One more test you need to perform is I get the 11.3 inches of water column, I get that, and that's wonderful, that's fantastic. But what's your fifth? What's your flow? So you're you're connecting directly into here, and is the refrigerator running? And it's got a nice little flame going on right here, and you're getting 11.3 because there's a difference between operating pressure and lock-up pressure, okay? And so you set your regulator to the operating pressure. That means with a 50% load, you're setting your regulator to that. And then when you turn the 50% load off, it should not go over, what, 14 or 15 inches. Anne's got her question up. Yes? Okay, so Rick asked, the, he's the same guy. Yep, yep. Um, so he says, oh, I also turned on the furnace while checking pressure through the fridge and pressure dropped to 9.9. Okay, and you've blown out the lines. Okay, he's blown out the lines. Um, maybe increase your regulator, but what state's he in? Because you gotta be careful. Everything I'm saying, some states won't let you touch this unless you're trained, like for example, Texas, for example, really strict. Um, none of this you can do in Texas unless you've got a license to do it. And then, you can't do it, even if you have a license, it's not good enough in Texas. You also have to have a, um, like a million dollar liability policy to touch anything RV on an RV, anything LP on an RV. So I'm covering all this information for your benefit, but don't get in trouble with the state or regulation agency by playing with LP on an RV. So let, that, that's my disclaimer. But now that we've established that, um, two things come to mind. One, it, okay, probably uh, in Patreon, somebody made a link on the different LP laws. Um, so I would, I would like to see this number up a little higher. Let's assume that this is your operating pressure. I wouldn't mind to see that closer to 13, okay? Try to see what that does. Uh, the other thing, you've got a new, okay, so we've talked about purging of cylinders, possibly in a previous video. We've talked about purging of cylinders. Um, so your refrigerator is on, you're traveling down the road, uh, you're, you're consuming 11.3 inches of water column, your refrigerator's working, but when you go down the road, the thing blows out. Um, and these are the kind where the electrode kind of comes up and goes like that over the gas, uh, over the burner. Um, there's this little window thing, make sure the window thing's closed. My knee jerk reaction is make sure that you driving in the wind doesn't blow it out, but normally that's not the case. Um, uh, you've blown out your lines. Uh, you've got a new cylinder because if you had air in your cylinder, all bets are off. You, that's a wild card. The only thing you want in your cylinder is propane. Liquid propane is the only thing you want in your cylinder. And if they didn't pro if they did not purge your cylinder properly, there could be some unknown quantity of air that you're compressing, and then you'll never get any of this. Um, this is pure unadulterated. Do not pass go 100% propane vapor. Um, so you've blown out your lines. You've got a good pressure. We've talked at length about the 8.7. You need to do your math to figure out what size hole you need. Um, we'll be coming out with an RV tech card. Those are things we're coming out with, where, with with this information on it, with all the different sizes. I'm not gonna print the entire list, but I'll do the, the standard sizes that we would have in our industry for an RVer. 
Um, so, yeah, I, I it could be wind. So we've talked about a lot of things. Um, you're going down the road and it's it's blowing the thing out. But does it work fine when it's sitting still? If it works fine when it's sitting still, but when you're traveling it blows it out, then that tells me maybe wind is blowing it out. So look for that. That's because it goes out almost every time cylinder was purged. Cylinder was purged. Okay, so now we know that the cylinder has 100% pure propane in it. You buy it as a liquid, we consume it as a vapor. Um, You've checked everything here. Um, this would be a fun one. Um, I like this kind of stuff. What I would be curious to do. But he didn't answer the question if it works when it's normal. Yeah, when it was sitting, what I'd be curious to know is I that little yellow um, manometer that I have, it's the electronic kind. It works fine sitting still. So. Okay, okay. The only thing that's changed in your equation is is your your is, is wind as you're driving. Um, but that little yellow one that I use has a min-max mode. And so what might be fun is to put your thing in at this point right here, run your refrigerator, and get your reading. Here, let me, here, here, I'm gonna finish up my answer with this idea, okay? So it seems that the only thing that's changed is you driving, okay? So here would be fun. If you happen to have one of those yellow uh, UGI, whatever, that yellow manometer, you've seen me use that before. You could get it on our Amazon affiliate link. Then use our tap jig, tap directly into the gas valve, and then stick your manometer over here, put it in min-max mode, and go travel, and see if your propane pressure for some reason should drop while you're traveling. If it does not drop while you're traveling, then it has nothing to do with the propane. There's something to do with the wind blowing on this area when you're driving. And in that instance, then you might get an anemometer, uh, the thing that you blow, blows wind, and just stick an anemometer in this area and drive and see if this thing has got some, some register on your anemometer, uh, they're not that expensive, um, but just stick an anemometer in this area and drive and see if there is a wind event going on inside this enclosure to see if it's wind blowing it out. So let's, I'll move on to the next question, but those are some of the things that we would look at when it works fine when you're sitting still, but it doesn't work when you're traveling. So I would check your min max on your propane and then I would do a anemometer to see if wind is, is in this area. So that would be my thought. Okay, erasing. I like my grease board. I could draw that ram again. All right. So if you're um, if you're tuned in and you had messaged me with a question and I said, "Hey, join us for the live stream," um, make sure that you put your question in the chat. Um, I did not queue it up, and so if. Yeah, if you had reached out with a question and I said to join us for a live stream and that we would answer it there, make sure that you put it in the chat. Did you want to ask the next one or do you want me to? Okay, um, Injustice says, do compatible 500 slash one slide out motors work as well as the actual Lippert ones? Here's my takeaway on that. I know what you're talking about because the Lippert one is close to $300 and the aftermarkets are like 70 bucks. Um, how many of the $70 motors could you buy for one Lippert motor is, is my knee-jerk reaction. Several, okay? So um, my RV Works would not put in a $70 motor for a customer because I don't know anything about that. If, if my RV Works is gonna re be replacing one of your 501 motors, my RV Works is gonna buy the official Lippert $300 motor, okay? Because of our business, I want to make sure that I'm putting in the proper spec part. The last thing I'm going to do is you pay me to put a motor in and it turns out to be a, a, a $70 motor and then the thing breaks and now I'm dealing with, well, a worksmanship warranty issue. But what I do then is I tell the customer, customer, you have options. My motor I'm going to get is a $300. Here's a link directly from Lippert. You can buy it. But over here you have one. I let the customer buy that motor. And then they just hire me to install the motor that they bought. Okay, I have no problem putting in the $70 motor. No problem at all. I can put those in all day long. But from the business side, I don't want my business to have the liability of putting in a $70 motor when the Lippert, official Lippert motor is the $300 motor. So, but I always like to give the customer the option. Okay, so, but no, I have no problem. If it was my personal RV, I put a $70 motor in the thing every day. I could go through three or four $70 motors over the next couple of years. So one $300 motor. You see my point? So, um, 
that's my answer on that. Okay. All right. So Ronnie, who's over on our Patreon as well, says, I've been trying to get a quote for general liability insurance for a mobile RV repair business. It seems it is much harder than I would have ever yes. thought. Any info you might have concerning this? Yes. Um, so we did a whole series on our Patreon side. I think he is. Just watch that I'll one. double check, but I think he subscribed at the $5, so he may not have okay, access okay. to so that. So on, on that, um, so we'll just talk business just for a moment for anybody who's here with, with that information. Um, I had the same rude wake up call uh, when oh, we. Oh, $15. Okay, so so wh I'm assuming you've watched the episode where we talk about insurance um, because there are several different insurances that you're going to want. Uh, here you're building your nest egg, you're putting your blood, sweat, and tears into building a business, and all of a sudden, every time you go out to work on somebody's RV, you are exposing yourself, your family, your nest egg, your livelihood to risk. So it's just the nature of the business. You're working with LP, electricity, um, slide room falls out. Who I've actually almost had a slide room fall out on me. So. So you want to make sure that you are properly insured and you're properly licensed and, and for the state that you need to be in, okay? So having said that, we had to find an insurance broker that understood the business we were in. All of the insurance brokers that we went through prior to the one that we found were for brick and mortar type companies that don't move. And so you could argue that, okay, well, I'll get the same kind of coverage that like the garage door people have or the electrical people have or the plumbing people have. The thing is, is that all those companies have a physical building that they operate out of. Our brand of the, our business model does not have a physical building. Our whole thing is, is traveling in a service trailer. And so it turned out that the kind of insurance we needed what would be, would, is called itinerant, okay? So like a carnival coming to town, okay? And so, it's called uh, Garage Keepers Coverage is one of the insurances we have. I'm trying to think of the other one. Um, we've got a couple different insurances, but here's the thing. You need to find a broker in your location that's licensed to do work in the state that you're in. If you're in Washington, we can recommend that we, the one that we use, um, that understands the type of business you have. Now, when I started this business, gosh, I think I went through like five or six. It was quite a few. They had nothing for us. They didn't even know where to begin. Because if I'm working over in Gig Harbor, and then I'm going over to Silverdale, and I'm going over here to Forks, and I'm over here in Aberdeen or wherever like that, the insurance needs to. There is no that. That's where that's where I'm located right there. Um, so to answer your question, you need to find a broker, an agent, a company that understands the type of business you're in. You do not have a brick and mortar, um, and you guys just got to go shopping around. Um, it, our insurance doesn't fit for a tow truck company. It doesn't fit for a, a plumber or an electrician or a garage door opener or any of these things because they always have a brick and mortar that they, they're dispatched from. We don't have that. And that is a huge, um, uh, what would I say, um, wake up call for folks that, oh, I'll just get me general liability. Well, yeah, but it's not tied to a physical building. Okay, so, um, so keep looking for that company. There are out there. You're going to want to find an agent that focuses on commercial type insurance, not residential. Um, and the way my agent explained it to me, what he, because it was an education for him as well. When we found this was in Texas, we went with a company in Texas, is what we started with. And he's like, it finally made sense to me that if I insure you as a like a, like the carnival coming to town, the Ferris wheels and stuff like that, um, then all of a sudden that opened up a whole new world of like, ah, that's how they get insured. Oh, fantastic. Um, so our agent had to get his head out of brick and mortar and move himself into more of a, a, a traveling type of a business. And the example he gave to me was like a carnival. So hopefully that helps. But um, but we did do the whole series on um, on insurance, uh, bank accounts, um, incorporating, um, all kinds of stuff. So you can go to our uh, playlist, our, our Patreon, and just see what those episodes are. And every week we come out with a new episode. And these episodes are 30, 40 minutes long, an hour long, and we go pretty deep. And uh, we've even done some spinoffs off of some of that because questions come back. So we're really, really trying to build value in what we're offering over on our Patreon side. Um, that is something we're excited about. It's something where the, the students, if you will, uh, are giving us feedback. And from that feedback, we're turning it and making that course even better. I, I, wish, I wish that there would have been something like that when I started the, my business, but um, we figured it all out. So I don't want you guys to waste as much time that I did in getting your businesses started 
Um, so just, yeah, for the car, for the $15 a month, you have access to tremendous information. The $25 a month has an access to a Zoom call that we, that you can actually get involved with. And that's kind of fun and exciting as well. So. All right. Um, and since you are over on Patreon, Ronnie, um, they did just add a collections tab. And so we put all of our episodes there. So it's just a little easier to find. So if you are on our Patreon and you go to that collections tab, you can see all of the different episodes and play them right there. Um, so I uh, just want to give a shout out to um, Alexander who is tuning in. He said, uh, he's a rookie RV tech and he Yay. just gave you a nice compliment. So oh, thanks, thank man. you and thanks for joining us. And then um, Bruce asks, our slide out makes a grinding noise at the end of travel, extending and retracting on one side of the slide out. What kind of slide out is this? Yeah, so if you can tell us, Bruce, what kind of slide out you have. We'll move on to the next question, but we'll circle back. Yeah, let me yours. know what kind of slide out it is. But just let me, okay, so it's when it's all the way extended, that last couple inches, it makes a grinding sound? It, he just says, at the end of travel, extending okay. and retracting on one side of the slide out. Yeah, I'd like to know what kind of slide room. Is it a Schwintech? Is it the, the, the uh, through frame? Um, yeah, let me know what kind of slide room that is because that changes how I would diagnose that. Yeah. So let us know. Um, and then Alexander says Texas has LP classes, right? Yeah. I remember. Um, Railroad there. Commission, uh, they're down in Austin. And the cool thing about that, so you go to a Railroad Commission, it's a couple hundred dollars. It's an eight hour course. You have to pass 90 or above, get your license. The cool thing about going to the class is right next door was this little, um, so all the stuff that gets confiscated by the um, TSA knives and all this kind of stuff, it all goes, it's like this, right next to the uh, Railroad Commission where you take your class, right next door was was like all the stuff that the TSA confiscated that you can buy. And so that was like really cool. I got some cool knives and all kinds of stuff for like pennies. So yeah, it's down in, it's down in Austin's Railroad Commission of Texas. Um, so yeah, that's where you go for your class. Okay. And it's a really good class. I mean, I learned a lot from that class, a lot. Um, I've since gone off to study. I've actually, I'm the guy that read the NFPA 1192.5. I'm the guy. Um, every single page, <laughs> every, every subpart B. Yeah, because I wanted to really make sure I understood. So that's good reading. Uh, you can't. You could buy that NFPA 1192. You can buy it, but it's very expensive. So you can view it online, just Google 1192.5 and you can read it. You can't print it or download it, but you can read it when it's on your computer. So just go to NFP 1192.5, uh, chapters three, three, four, five, somewhere there. And they go through how to do an LP pressure test. They go through everything, the propane math, everything. It's, it's really exciting reading. I enjoyed reading it. Um, but. I like reading those things because it takes all the guesswork out of the good old boy network on, well, that's how you're supposed to do it. Well, no, the 1192.5 says this is how you do it. And that's what I like to base all my business knowledge on. So, and there's also a UL book that's fun to read too. Okay. All right, so sorry if there was any confusion. Um, so if you are a Patreon uh, subscriber, we um, put on the calendar both live stream events. Um, but no, you have not missed the Patreon live stream. That actually starts right around 545, and you'll have a post in Patreon that will have the link. So we do a general live stream here on YouTube, and then we do an exclusive live stream over on Patreon. So the general live stream starts at 430 uh, Pacific time, and then the Patreon live stream starts about 545 <laughs> Pacific time. And um, uh, we are on a delay um, not only are we not caught up all the way with the comments, um, but also there's just a little delay back and forth. So if you are commenting and we're not responding in real time, that's why. Um, so I saw there was a request to have the camera moved up, like a zoom this in one? to Darren. I might try that in just a second, but maybe you were wanting to see something specific. Oh, okay. um, but I will move on. Um, so that was, yeah, Patrick had wanted to know yeah, if he missed yeah. the pa Patreon oh, Q&A. Okay. So, um, no, you have not. Um, and uh, there will be a post in Patreon that you can click on the link um, at 545. And you'll also get a message through Patreon. And it'll be on the calendar. Um, so let's see. 
I don't really know injustice or George, I don't really know what the question do you stalk the lipper? I think you had asked, I think that's the one we're waiting on. So yeah, just if, let us know what kind of slide you have and then we can circle back to your question. And then Old Yeller <laughs> I love it. asks, on a converter, if it changes, fine and the fan doesn't kick on at any time will it overload or overheat or damage the battery bank uh converter fan not turning on that's the crux of the question Con converter fan i think okay. so the, the converter fan will not affect the battery bank but the converter fan not blowing might affect the converter itself okay um so that would be my my answer on that. Yeah. Do I need to move that closer? I can get to it a little bit easier. Here. Let me... Oh, after you said that's good, I moved it. Better? Worse? <laughs> Say something. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Thanks for being patient with us. <laughs> Looks like it's not seeing, but here, just give me feedback because yeah, I can see. Yeah, we're good. No, no, no. It's that's good. good. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I can see it, so that's why I was. Yay. Okay. And yeah, give us feedback on if our sound's not right, which you guys already did, or if you want the cameras moved. It's right there. We can move it. So just let us know. We're here for you. Okay, so um, Alexander says, what if the bedroom slide out motor breaks? in the retracted position. How do you get the slide back out before I can replace the motor? All right, I'm gonna, again, I need to know what kind of slide room we're dealing with. I'm gonna I assume Schwintech. I, uh, let me. Yeah, because there's several different types of slide rooms out there. I need to know what kind of slide room we're dealing with. I thought it was a continuation of a previous question, but it is, doesn't look like it is. Okay, But so, if it's a Schwintech, and it, I'll, yeah. I'll, that's a common. Okay, so and I'll, I should have said this at the beginning. So the most helpful thing when you're putting in your question is for us to know the manufacturer and the model number. So we don't need to necessarily know what kind of RV you're driving, but the manufacturer <laughs> and the model number of the appliance that you are having a question on is very helpful. Um, so you want me to turn it over to you to sure, answer I can, it as yeah. a Schwintech? Okay. Um, so I'll assume, okay, so so for those of you who have a Schwintech, now the Schwintech, uh, the Schwintech, uh, was a company that Lippert bought and they changed the name from Schwintech to Lippert in-wall system, okay? We all know what is Schwintech. It's like Kleenex or Q-tip or Xerox. A bunch of different names for things, but we just call it a Kleenex. So we all call it a Schwintech. Uh, these are the rooms that have the racks along the top of the bottom and the motors are inside. So that's, that's the Schwintech. That's the Lippert in-wall system. The challenge that I think is the question is the room is all the way in and you can't get to the motor. Um, so there's a couple things. Um, sometimes these are really, really hard. Um, seriously, within an hour or two just to get to the thing. But there's a retaining screw on the outside that keeps that motor into its bearing block, okay? And in a perfect world, you can gain access to the outside, take the retaining screw out, and the motor pops right up. But in this instance, the room's in, you can't get to the retaining screw. If you can get to the motor on the inside, then you could take a chisel, you could take a crowbar. I have a screwdriver that is used for pounding. And you can drive your screwdriver between the motor and the bearing block, and you can force that motor up, overcoming the screw from the outside. Now, you will wallow out the hole on the outside, um, but sometimes that's your only bet. Um, before you do that, though, um, what I would ask you to do is try to overcome, like, okay, if the wiring going to the motor is bad because the motor spun around itself, then the, the set screw it has already been compromised. If the set screw is in, then it kind of prevents the motor from popping out and spinning around on itself, okay? Um, so, there's a couple different ways this can go. Let's say the motor is seated inside of its bearing block. The, the wires are intact, but it's just not working. If you can get access to the wiring harness that feeds that motor, what you're after is a red and black wire. The red and black wire are the two wires that feed the motor power. The purple, the brown, the green, those other colors, that has everything to do with the Hall effect sensor that's sending the signals, the pulses, and all that kind of stuff. So you can ignore that. 
even if you can go to the controller where your wire, motor wire harness is connected, I did this in a video. You could watch the video. You could go to our playlist, go to slide room videos. You'll see one. Um, I don't remember which one, but um, it's a Schwinn Tech. It's a Schwinn Tech repair that we did. Um, you saw me tap into the red and black wire directly at the control module. Um, that's what I want you to do. See if before you go through trying to get that motor out, see if you can at least get that room out with the um, the red and black energizing those. It, Polarity doesn't matter. Polarity determines the direction. It's either go in or clockwise or counterclockwise, okay? If you disconnect the two harnesses at the controller with a couple good, strong, corn fred, beefy boys, you can push that slide room out. It's hard, and once you get some momentum, keep on it. But it will go. I've done it several times. It's hard to get it going. Uh, sometimes I've even used the hydraulic ram to kind of push it with those wires disconnected. Um, He's confirmed that it's okay. Okay, it is a liver twin tech. So um, first, try to see if you can energize your red and black wires. You've seen, watch a video. Go go to our playlist. You'll see me doing that with my battery pack. I got a twelve volt battery pack on my drill, and I just do that that way. If that doesn't work, disconnect it and see if you can physically push it out. Sometimes the way that they have failed, it's binded up. And if it's that bad, then you're gonna need a hydraulic ram or something with some really good strong force to kind of push that thing apart and overcome whatever it is that's holding it in. Um, big crowbars, I mean, you're looking like body shop type stuff just to get this thing out. Um, my best practice for these things is once they start to eat themselves. Now, if it's just a motor, fine, we can replace the motor, but if you have, failed components or fatiguing components. I'm not a fan of just replacing a spur gear, okay? Because if that spur, if the spur gear is stripped, that means that your rack has also maybe got some wallowed out parts on it. But if the spur gear strap, uh, if the spur gear has stripped or broken some teeth, there's other stress points on that system. It's an aluminum system. And so for 600 to $800 to $900, you can buy an entire new Schwintech assembly, left and right, everything. And I've done several videos where I replace those things. For me, it's much more cost effective, even though you're paying all this money to buy the whole system, to replace the entire system than to start swapping out pieces parts. Because every time you gotta swap out a pieces part, you gotta take the whole column off. My attitude is if I gotta take the whole column off and disassemble it to replace that part, why not replace it with a brand new assembly? And that way you're not mixing good pieces with bad pieces. And now it might work because you put the new piece in, maybe your plastic shoe broke, okay? Um, and you, you put the piece in, and then a couple months later it breaks again because it's not broken now, but it's fatigued and it might break later. Um, so I am a big fan, a big advocate of when there's issues with your Schwintech and there's grinding noises or things aren't aligned properly. Um, honestly, I've said this in my videos, the biggest challenge I have with a Schwintech system is it's not being lubricated properly. And the lubricant you want is the uh, CRC Power Lube with Teflon, PTFE. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I've been called in. I I'm talking dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and many, maybe even over a hundred times I've been called in to fix your Swintech system. The system's eating itself, it's grinded, it's seized, it's not moving, nothing's wrong with this thing. And the whole time, the whole problem was it wasn't lubricated. If something as simple as lubricating these things properly, I'd be out of business on the Swintech and that'd be wonderful because they are a bear to work on. Um, so, if your room is in all the way and you can't get it out, try to energize it with your black and red wire, disconnect your motor harnesses, try to push it out. If none of that works and you can get to the motor, Drive a little long screwdriver into it, pop up the motor, try to see if you can push it out there. Um, so these would be some things that you could try, but it's just being a MacGyver trying to figure out how to get into the thing. Um, and then worse, you could, on the side of the H column, you will you should find a sticker. It's got a V number. Is it the V number that they want? Or somebody corrected me. They didn't want the V number. They wanted another number. But just take a picture of that sticker. Even if your Schwintech's not broken at all, um, it might be good for you to go do your homework and take a picture of that sticker so you have it, okay? So if you do want to get any replacement parts or you do need to replace the entire assembly, that's the information they need to send you the right one. Um, so there's some thoughts on that. 
All right, and so we're going to circle back to Bruce's question. Um, so he says, our slide out makes a grinding noise at the end of travel, extending and retracting on one side of the slide out. It is the last inch in and out, and it is in the bedroom, and it is a leverage. Schwentech. Okay, the last inch. Um, the last inch. Grinding noise, the last inch. I would ask you, is there any evidence of any metal shavings um, down at the base of your ball? Uh, not the part that goes in and out. I'm looking for metal shavings. I'd also be curious what the condition is, is of your rack, uh, if that's being chewed up. Uh, grinding noise on that. Um, I did one not too long ago, and all the noise. This, this he paid us all this money, and the problem was, it was a simple problem. The problem had nothing to do with the Schwintech. It was the slide topper was installed incorrectly, and the slide topper was making this terrible sound. But it was because as a slide topper was being, as the room was going out, the the, the bracket that held the slide topper was being bent in because whoever installed it didn't put the screws in. And so the whole bracket of the slide topper was moving, and then the fabric was rubbing along the, the top flange of the slide room going out, and it was making a terrible noise. And he was convinced it was a, swin, it was a slide room. There's nothing wrong with the slide room. Um, anyway, I volunteer that information because we need to verify that the sound is actually coming from the Swintech itself and not a slide topper, for example. Um, grinding noise going all the way in and out on a Swintech. Um, you know what? What's Darren going to say? All together now lubrication. Uh, the whole thing, if you can visualize, let me figure out how to draw this. Okay, so here is your... How am I going to draw this? Okay. Um, there's the wall of your RV. I just sliced it in half. Okay, so this is outside. Am I on the video? Okay, and this is inside. I N S I D whatever. Okay. Um, here's your motor up here. Okay, drive shaft comes down. Okay, and uh, then you have these little collets, or no, you have these little bearing blocks in your wall. Okay, you don't see these, these are in the wall. Um, and they have these little ears on them right here. Okay, um, and what I have found, okay, so that's kind of what you got there, and I'll go to black. Here, let me make black be the wall because I, I want you to lubricate this, but I want to show you. A very specific place to lubricate this thing. So that's your column. There's your drive shaft. And then here is the actual column itself. And it's not to scale. But then you have these little gib things here. Now, Lippert has changed their design I don't know how many times. These started off as pieces of metal. Then they went to a piece of poly. And then they changed the diameter of them. And it's just Tab A does not fit in a slot B anymore, which is a whole other reason why I'm a big fan of just replacing the entire thing because they went from a, a round drive shaft with slots to now it's like an octagon, octagonal drive shaft. One used to be aluminum, now it's steel. The width of the column is thinner or thicker. Um, it, it just so many pieces they keep changing. The, the rack itself, um, if I were to do a profile of the rack, um, and then here's all your teeth, um, Sometimes a fin goes up, and then sometimes they've got it where the fin goes down. There's no rhyme or reason to how many times they've changed these things. It makes it very difficult for me to stock parts. But where your sound may be coming from, maybe, is you have these little gibs. These are riveted to the, the frame, the column itself. You'll see, if you, if you look at your column from the outside, you'll see a rivet right there. And then there's actually two rivets, but the second rivet is actually behind that the bulb seal. Okay, you can peel it back, you might see it. But that is basically riveting this. If you have a steel one, this is where the noise really comes from. They've uh, fixed the noise lately with using a poly type thing. But what I want you to do is I want you to get your can of green CRC power lube with PTFE. I want to get your straw, and I want you to squirt in this area on both sides. What this thing, what these gibs do, the, the black gibs are basically riveted to the frame, and then this bearing block is allowed to, to float in, inside there. So as your room is moving around, it's, it's able to float in there. That, that gives you this lateral movement. And if you have a lot of weight on these gibs, first of all, they're gonna break, <laughs> okay? Um, and then you also have a ceramic wheel right there, 
so I want to know the condition of your ceramic wheel. Um, the entire Swintec weight should be on the rollers on the bottom, okay? So there should be rollers, and if you look in the manual, they tell you exactly how many inches inboard they should be, all this kind of stuff, okay? But the weight should be in the rollers. So I'm going to make an assumption that your problem is that when it's all the way coming in, something happens, and the weight comes off the roller, and it's transferred to the gib here. And then as this room comes in, it might make that final little adjustment, and this terrible <clears throat> creaking sound is the metal, if you've got the metal kind, it's a, it's, a, it's a steel gib on an aluminum bearing block. And they made the worst sound, and I'm kind of glad that they changed it to a poly if I were to kind of bring this out a little bit. Okay, um, and then this, bearing, this, this gib goes like this. I'm trying to make it three-dimensional to show you. Anyway, so this um, bearing, so that's where I want you, I want you to look at that. I want you to lubricate your Swintec. That's what I want you to do. And um, I'm thinking that uh, getting it right inside of these spots right here might fix your problem. Um, while you're at it in that video I did on where to lubricate, so go to our playlist where I have the, the, the carcass of a Swintec standing up with a tree behind it or something. Uh, we did it in a pretty noisy environment. And the guy that was doing the camera wasn't following what I was doing. But anyway, there's good information. I do want to redo that video. But I want you to get some right there, okay? Because there's a steel collet right here. So I don't want you to get it above. I want you to get right in there. I want you to get right in here where the gibs are. And then on your rack, okay, I want you to get in this track right here because this is where the shoe glides i don't don't you don't need to put any spray on your gear on your track with the teeth on it i need it in this slot right there that's where we need it because that's what's sliding back and forth you lubricate all those places and see if that doesn't fix this creaky cranky sound okay deal all right i'm gonna erase my beautiful drawing all right um, so we have a few more questions that we will get to before we end, but we are kind of starting to wrap it up. And, um, oh, wow, that is blurry. Sorry, guys. I have no idea what's going on with the camera, but I'm just going to transfer to you and I will ask. Tell me. So Gerard asks, how would you handle hydraulic jack down call? We see this one frequently when folks want to go home and lose their patience. Okay. Um, if, okay, perfect. Um, I can do that one. Okay, so here is a ceramic, or ceramic. I can draw, I just, and I, I, I'm a very good writer, but I just, my spelling is, not my spelling, my grammar is not good. So here we have a hydraulic jack, okay? If they want to go home, I, I, I approach these problems one of two ways. One, do you want me to fix this? Two, do you want me just to get you so you can drive? And typically, when I come across a hydraulic job as a mobile RV service, I'm not really set up to do hydraulic repair in the field. I know hydraulic, I know it very well, but I know it enough to know that that's usually something better done at a shop, okay? Partly because you want to keep your hydraulic fluid clean and all these kinds of things, and I can't control what I run into how you're in the field, okay? So it's really simple. You're going you're gonna to think how simple this is. My goal is to get this so they can go home, okay? Now, some of your jacks are gonna have a spring return, okay? Um, okay, there's a spring. If they have a spring return, great. If they don't, great. Either way, it doesn't matter. Here's what you do. It's gonna make a mess. Don't call the EPA. So what I do is I carry um, EPA-type absorbent pads, and so you're gonna have a hydraulic fitting you may, if you have a spring return, you're going to only have one and let the spring return up at the top. So there's going to be a fitting right here and a fitting right here, okay? These things are going to be under tremendous pressure, okay? But you can waste time trying to go work on the pump, the reservoir, the manifold, the, the solenoids, all that, all you want to, and that's wonderful. Knock yourself out. It's a lot of fun, okay? But the goal is get them home. Don't lose sight of the goal. What I do is under a lot of pressure. Remember, you will get hurt if you're not careful. 
And what's scary even more is sometimes you're underneath an RV, okay? You crack this line. You wrap it up in these absorbent pads, okay? You crack the line and maybe crack both of them and, and do it very slowly. Hopefully you can get a little bit of a drip, 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 because if you do it too fast, what, 12,000 PSI is gonna squirt out at you, it'll hurt you. And then the whole RV will lunge down on top of you and crush you, so you don't wanna do that, okay? But if you crack this line very slowly, if it's spring return, great, the springs will start bringing it back up. If it's not spring return, you should have a bottle jack or a jack of some type, stick, crowbar, anything, and you crack your line and you get your long crowbar under here and you try to push this jack manually up. But the only reason this would, now that would work if your cylinder, your ram is not compromised and not bent, okay? So let's just assume that there's a problem with a solenoid, there's a problem with the motor, there's a problem with something downstream. We're not there to troubleshoot that. We're there to get the jacks up so they can drive and then take it to a shop or get it out of the spot that has already been rented out to the next person. You need to get the people out of there so they can take it someplace else. Crack the lines, grab all the fluid in the um, uh, EPA rated absorbent pads, crack it very slowly because once this thing gives, it's gonna, it's gonna give, it's gonna, it'll hurt you. And then get all the pressure off this thing. And then if it's spring return, the springs will bring it back up. And as this thing's going back up, you're going to have all the fluid squirting out on you, okay? So you might have to have a whole bunch of these rags in a bucket and everything just to collect it, okay? Once it gets up, great. Tie everything back up again. And a lot of times I'll tie this thing up with tie wraps or I got the big giant tie wraps I use on wind turbines is where I got them from. Um, well, I learned about them there and then I got some because they're like these big hardcore tie wrap as a manufacturer. These things are like a half inch thick and like three feet long. Um, I use those if, if for this type of reason right here, or if an awning, we need to get that awning so we can go down the highway. Good to have really hardcore, big, very industrial strong um, cable ties, tie wraps. Anyway, so crack your line. That's your quickest, easiest way to get this up. Now, if for some reason this is bent, we have come across where they something happened and this thing was bent like that, you have no other choice but again, to crack your line, and they usually have ears with all these holes on the side, you gotta take the ram off. You just gotta take this off. And then hopefully cap these. A lot of times I'm not gonna have the fittings to cap this, so you just kinda take it off, get all the pressure out, and just take electrical tape and tape it all up so that when they get to the shop, they can get a new one of these things and they can put this back in and reflood the system. Okay, so that is my go-to on how to do it. I do this several times a year. People are stuck at the campground. They can either pay me all the time it takes to diagnose a problem, but they need to go. So that's my solution right there. All right, I wanna say thanks to Lee. He says thanks for all your help. Hey, you're welcome. That's why we do this. And then um, we'll get to a couple questions. A couple of you are on Patreon, so I may save those questions for when we hop over there in just a minute. And not only will you have access to that if you tune in live, but you also can access that later on by clicking on the link. So, um, okay, so rooftop AC question. I've got a couple of 20 year old duo therm brisk air units. I just replaced a fan motor on one unit. Should I also replace the capacitors even though they still work fine? Capacitors are from 12 to 20 bucks. It, if they're, a capacitor has no moving parts, okay, but if they've been hit with some dirty bad power, they could compromise themselves. It's kind of like, the capacitors are not expensive. These are like, like I said, 12, 20, $25 for a capacitor. It, it's preventative maintenance just to put a new one on there. But even if you have a brand new capacitor on there and you go somewhere and you got dirty power, I don't care how new that capacitor is, it's gonna take a hit. Um, so it wouldn't be bad to have the capacitor with you, but I don't know that I would actually put it on, I would just kind of keep it in my parts bin, um, if that makes sense. It's not like headlights, whereas if one goes, the other one's going to have to work harder and you just replace them both at the same time, especially if you have a Ford, you got to take a whole front grill apart just to change a bulb. So you have different philosophies on those things. Um, it's preventative maintenance, absolutely. But like I said, anytime you're going to get dirty power, the capacitor is going to be the thing that takes a hit. Um, so it's good enough to have one. But if the other ones are working just fine, I would test it, test your capacitor, get a meter that's got the capacitor mode on it. The capacitor meter looks, might have it exactly backwards, but it's gonna look like this. 
that's your symbol. <laughs> Is that, was it this way? OK, I think it looks like that. I remember it being an umbrella with this coming down on it. So that's your capacitor symbol on your meter. OK, and then you look on the capacitor itself, and it's going to say how many microfarads it's got. And then you take your, um, they have capacitor discharge tools. Um, yes, you could short it out with a screwdriver or needle nose plier, but the, for 10 bucks, go get a capacitor discharge tool. Um, they don't cost that much, and there's all kinds of, I was, I was thinking T3 interface could make the capacitor discharge tool, but when I saw there were 10 bucks, I was like, I'm not even going to make those. Somebody else can. Anyway, um, you put these off, and then you, you bleed the thing out through a little resistor, um, and I put a light bulb on it. And um, you bleed out the capacitor, and then you write the, the five. You take your lead, plus and minus, in this symbol here, and you read to see does a meter say it's what it's supposed to be, plus or minus 10%. And if it does, the capacitor's fine. There's no reason to replace it, but it wouldn't be bad to have a spare. All right, and then Alexander um, was the one that had uh, talked about the slide and accessing the motor earlier. Yes. And so he was just um, saying thank you, and oh, yeah. that, that's what he wanted you to talk about. Um, he said he took the exteriors class at NRVTA, um, and he wanted you to talk about it because it's important in a very tricky situation. He said yes. the instructor said you might want to drill a hole where the retaining screw is from the outside and reseal it so if it happens, you can access it from the outside top left. Side. I love that idea, but I'm not going to drill. I'm not going to do that to my customer's RV. Uh, they can do it for my benefit, but yeah, that's a wonderful way to, to access that. In fact, that's a brilliant idea. If, if the manufacturers would actually make little caps to cover over that, that'd be perfect. But unfortunately, a lot of times they don't. So my way is just to overcome it with a long crowbar. I've got a special screwdriver that I use. It's got a, a, a keystone tip on it. Just tap that in there and pop the motor up. And yes, it wallows out the the, the aluminum. And so I would just go to the next bigger size screw thread. I think those are, somebody asked that question. I actually went and it's a metric thread. I actually went and measured that. And in one of my videos, um, one of our 10 minute tech videos, I do answer the question what size screw that is. Um, but I also carry a tap and die set. And so if I needed to, I would, wallow, if it wallows out, um, I would go up a size or two or three even and um, retap it, put blue thread lacquer on it, and put every time I ever put those screws back in, I always gonna use blue thread lacquer um, just to keep it in. You can easily overcome the blue thread lacquer. It's not like red, <laughs> but we gotta heat it up or something. But um, yeah, I use blue thread lacquer on a lot of things. Um, the door handles, where you open and close a door, those are always getting loose. Anytime I ever work on a TV mounting bracket, blue thread lacquer, the blue screws on, the, on these things, blue thread lacquer. Um, couple other things so another good tip all right and he said his dad was able to replace his automatic transfer switch from I think one of the videos oh, good. So yeah. that's very cool we did that with for Eric for Techno RV um, he had a demo unit that they gave him to try and the one we put in didn't work so we had to troubleshoot that one and put the old one back on so yeah and then trucker 23 just said some nice things so thank you, thank you. Thank you. and then I never get to see the comments yeah. <laughs> yeah, I missed that part. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if this like is a question, but I'll just read it to you. And it says Gilbert, or so the Gilbert is the person asking okay. the question. Broken Gib on H column yep. Gib fell out. You can rivet it back on. Um, uh, the rivets even okay. So on that, even if your Gib uh, here, let me do it this way. Um, it turns out that okay. So here is uh uh. Uh, I know where I know where I'm going with this. Okay. I'm gonna. So yes, the gibs do break, and why would a gib break altogether now? Because the weight of the room is not on the rollers; it's on the gibs, and that's not where the weight is supposed to be. The weight is not supposed to be on the gibs. The weight is not supposed to be on the ceramic wheel. The weight is supposed to be on the rollers underneath. And so, if the weight's not on the rollers underneath, then you can take shims, go to the hardware store, get yourself some of that like aluminum or, or uh, um, galvanized sheeting, you know, and and jack up your room a little bit and put that underneath the roller and then so if, if here I'm going to answer this two ways here's your roller okay and then they have like a little little ear thing like a rolling pin and here's your room okay and uh, if the weight is on the roll the ceramic wheel over here or the gib then it's not here so it's almost 
practically impossible, realistically, to adjust that roller. You just can't get in there. And so what you then do, uh, let's try to see if I can make this three-dimensional. Then you're going to, okay, um, I'm, I'm looking up underneath of the room here, and um, you're going to want to get a piece of steel and put your screws over on the side. So when the roller is rolling, it's rolling on this part of the steel, and it's not hitting your screws. If it hits your screws, then you're going to have little, little, you're going to start wearing out that roller. So keep playing with the thickness that you need on these sheets of steel to get the room elevated up enough. The challenge with that, though, is sometimes if you go too high, it. We talked earlier in the series in, in this live stream on how to adjust these these slide rooms that that have the ram that comes out. If you go too high, now you've created another problem where you got to make sure it's going to close properly. So whenever you do anything to a room, you got to adjust it in and adjust it out. But if your gib breaks, it's because of the weight, and we just talked about that. So here is the bearing block. Oh, look at that. That's beautiful. Okay. And the gib is like right in here. Okay. That is your gib and it's connected to the H column. So when I've replaced these, it turns out that if you put your rivet, here's your, man, here's your rivet head, that there is all kinds of room on this side for the thing to mushroom itself on this side of the, the spot. Okay. So I, I thought I was going to put a rivet in there to put the gib back on and then the the mushy part of the rivet where the mandrel pulled it through was going to interfere with the void but no I've always had enough room inside the void so I've put these gibs back on and there's this big part of the rivet that mushrooms out and it's never ever interfered with this void that they put here so a rivet I'd go with a steel rivet not an aluminum one and um, I stock rivets just for that purpose because sometimes the gib breaks. But every time I've seen a gib break, guess what? It's because the weight's on the gib and you gotta fix that problem first or you're gonna be fixing this problem all day long, okay? So, rivet. Okay. I'll if I knew the size of the rivet, I'd share it, but I just don't know, but just you could figure that out. If you're doing this kind of work and you're talking this kind of stuff, I'm sure you could figure out how to size your rivet, but go with steel. All right, I'm gonna see if it's Okay, good. It's not super blurry. All right, so we're going to wrap up there. Um, Kyle and Ronnie, since you're over on our Patreon, I'm going to go ahead and answer your questions. Um, we'll, we'll answer your questions over there in just a minute. And like I said, if you don't have time to join us over there, um, that's fine. We'll just go ahead and uh, answer the question, and then um, you can just refer back to the link um, and watch it at your convenience. Um, so we do go live every month here on YouTube um, and uh, we just answer your questions as you put them in and so um, if you have a question between now and the first Friday of October and it can wait feel free to just store that question and join us for our next live stream so that's the first Friday of every month we go live on YouTube at 430 and I'm just gonna make sure that that is true because sometimes we're busy on the first Friday. Yep, so Friday, October 6th at 4.30, we will be coming to you live. Thank you so much for joining happy us. Happy Labor Day. Um, happy Labor Day. Yes. I don't know what date that is, but I know it's coming up <laughs> it's here. It's this Monday. Oh, it is it? Okay, cool. Yeah, and if you're one of our Patreon subscribers, um, feel free to join us over there. We'll have an exclusive live stream. Um, there's usually just a handful of people, and so we can talk a lot uh, more in depth and we usually talk a little bit more business on there as well so we don't have to but if you have business questions that's a great place to ask so thanks for joining us and we will see you on the next one I'm just gonna check and make sure I don't have anything else to address before oh, oh that's, it's a vehicle it's, okay, it's okay. parked in the back now okay okay I just make sure that we are Okay, I, uh, Roy, I attended a class with Lippert and they said not to leave the Schwintech. I know, and, and I'm 100% against that. Um, and like I said, I even have gone public on this on my videos. I have no idea why Lippert would say that. But every, pretty much every job I've ever gone on on a Lippert Schwintech system was because it was not lubricated. I have no idea, I can't even comprehend why they would say not to do that. But you, 
we're all big boys and girls. I'm just another voice in the forest like John the Baptist out there telling you how to keep your Schwinn tech good and working. Um, but not just any lubricant. You gotta use a CRC with power lube. That's the key. But I have no idea why they would say not to lubricate it. I have no idea in the world. All right, that's it. But don't lose our number. And if when it when it breaks because you didn't lubricate it, um, you come see us because we can get it fixed for you. It's gonna cost you a lot of money. Uh, that can of lubricant's a lot cheaper. What what's the worst thing that can happen by lubricating it? What's the worst thing that can? You're not gonna break anything. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I have no idea why they would say because a can of lubricant is like twenty bucks for a can, but an entire the, there's a two thousand dollar repair job. I'd buy the twenty dollar can of lubricant. Anyway, okay. See you on the next video, guys.